I'm so glad that I didn't have to clean up and get uh, perfect to become part of God's church. Um, so glad that he took me like I was and he did the cleaning up. So hopefully this song will bless your heart today. of the person that I was devastation came I found my strength was not enough a light stood shining on a hill through tears my eyes could see upon the path I saw that there were others just like me broken vessels just like me Oh, but God will search His with broken people, with hurting people, with searching people, and somehow these imperfect people find strength to Traveler's load of pain or guilt or strife. They have come to see his face, and in his light they bow. The shattered dreams and broken hearts, yet with his hands somehow, with loving hands somehow. All right, another great message and a song. I'm glad God specializes in, in messed up people. Uh, and that way I had a chance, all right? Amen. Good to have Brother Travis back with us. Enjoyed our time today uh, fellowshipping and looking forward to what God has for us tonight. Brother Travis, you come on and just make yourself at home. Amen. All right. <clears throat> A preacher is uh, is it on Facebook tonight? On live stream it is okay. My mother has been blowing my phone up. She she lives down in in South Florida, and uh, mom will be eighty this year. Later this year, she's I'm over there trying to pray, and she's blowing my phone up. Are you preaching tonight? It's after five. I can't find you on there. <laughs> I'm texting her back. I think so, mama. I'm not sure. Uh, 
And she just messaged me right here. Let's see. She said, I'm at the same place as I was this morning. I'm going to have to put that phone down. My mama is my prayer warrior. And um, uh, my mama got saved about two months before me. So when she was in her, uh, I guess, early 50s or so, um, I had been going to church with my best friend Joe because his daddy was, was a, a pastor. And we graduated high school in 1994. And uh, for whatever reason that summer, I say for whatever reason, it was the Lord at work. I didn't know it then. I know it now. But he said, won't you come hang out with me at church? And I started going to church with my, with my buddy Joe. And uh, he was there because he had to be. He was the preacher's son, and there was no uh, ifs, ands, or buts about it. And I came, and we just hung out in the sound booth, because he ran the sound, <clears throat> and uh, started going to church, and went seven, eight services in a row, <clears throat> and I was lost, didn't know nothing about church, but I liked it. I liked the people. And uh, I went home and told my mom and my stepdad, I said, y'all ought to go over there to Joe's daddy's church. I've been going, and it's... Uh, it's a pretty neat place. Well, my mom went along with my stepdad, and uh, they they went one Sunday, and the pastor came to uh, uh, Malcolm Senior. He came to my my house on that Monday night on visitation, and he won my mother to the Lord, and my stepdad rededicated his life to Christ, and they immediately joined the church. And my mom immediately got a burden for me to be saved. And she started praying and telling me she was praying. She started writing homemade gospel tracks on whatever she could find and uh, stuffed them in my underwear and sock drawer. And I would find them early in the morning when I was trying to get ready for work and read it and get under conviction. And about two months of that was all I could take. And, and God saved me. And, uh, and so, a long story short, Mama is my prayer warrior, and she's the only one I text while I'm in church, all right? You got to forgive me for that. Uh, I want you to take your Bible tonight and go to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and thank you so much for being in your place tonight, and uh, uh, us preachers know that church is a lonely place to be if we're, when we're the only one. Preachers spend a lot of time in churches when it's just nobody else there, you know. Uh, we'll be working around the church or maybe come in to pray or prepare or whatever. And, and it's a lonely place when, when you're not here. So thank you for being here. I want to ask you to get one of our ministry brochures on the, on the table out there when you leave. And pray for our ministry uh, to the unsheltered around the world. That's what we do. Uh, we bring help and hope to the, to the unsheltered around the world. We have uh, a vibrant ministry in the Philippines. We have a vibrant ministry in Coleman, Alabama. And we go other places as well. Um, our team in the Philippines sends us updates weekly. This morning the update was, they sent me pictures and everything, they, uh, we have a homeless ministry there, and it's all Filipino run. It's under our umbrella, but it's Filipino run. They have a 79-year-old lady who's sleeping on the sidewalk. She sells vegetables to try to make enough money to buy rice and other food, and she has an adult special needs son that lives with her there on the sidewalk as well. And they're both in bad physical condition and they asked for prayer because they're trying to find shelter for this uh, 79-year-old mom and the adult special needs son. It's not like it is here. There's no Salvation Armies there. There's no missions. Our ministry is, is uh, the only ministry of, uh, of that sort that I know of in a city of 600,000 people. In, uh, in Bacolid City, Philippines. And uh, the needs over there are dire. When you look at a 79-year-old lady, if I showed you the pictures on my phone and, and just laying there in destitution, it's sad. 
And there's, uh, we have uh, uh, over 400 children in our ministry each week over there. And some of the situations will just break your heart. And then there in Alabama where we are, um, the, uh, the lostness and the, the, uh, just the, the, the needs of people that are mentally ill and, uh, and, and other things uh, tears my heart up. And we're doing our best to make a difference. And you know, you can make a difference in this world. I hear a lot of Christians as I travel, a lot of Christians bemoaning the fact that, uh, you know, these are the last days and it's, uh, things are worse now than they've ever been. And I won't argue with none of that. But my pastor said something so wise uh, he said, the darker the night, the brighter the light. And I think we're living in a, in a terrific day to be servants of the Lord. Because the message we have is not popular. The message we have is not mainstream. But that just makes it oh so peculiar, oh so special. Oh, so needed. Now I want you to know in our ministry to the homeless, the main thing we focus on is what I call lostness. I don't, that may not be a word, but, but that's what it is. We can reform people all day and we can uh, re, uh, rehab people all day. But if their heart's not changed by Jesus... It's a, it's a never-ending cycle. And so that's what we seek to do. And I would appreciate your prayers in that because prayer is the power to, uh, to all of our ministry. Amen? Uh, well, I want to read some verses in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. I want to read uh, starting in verse 1. The Bible says, For yourselves, brethren, know... Our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain. But even after that, we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as ye know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. For neither at any time used we flattering words, as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness, nor of men sought we glory, neither of you, nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. So we, being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear unto us. Now those of you that were here this morning, I intended to read that last verse, verse 8, to you this morning. We talked this morning about when your heart is in it. And in that verse, verse 8 says that uh, they did not impart to them the gospel of God only, but also their own souls. What's that mean? It means their heart was in it. Amen? 
Let's look at two more verses, uh, verses 19 and 20. Uh, The last two verses of this chapter. It says, For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? For ye are our glory and joy. For ye are our glory and joy. You know, uh, my wife and I have kids like, like probably many of you do. And our kids, I can honestly say, have been a great joy to us through the years. Our son Hunter is, is 21 now. Our daughter Sarah, it's hard to believe, but she's 18 now. And Chris and Kathy know our kids. I was catching them up about them over lunch. And um, both of them have, have had a, a, a pretty severe drug problem. We drug them to church every Sunday morning and every Sunday night, amen, and every Wednesday night. And uh, honestly, though, they, they've, they've been good kids. They've been good sports. We're missionaries. And uh, a missionary kid has to be a good sport or their life will be miserable. We've made it fun for them. We've tried to make it fun over the years as we've traveled and different things, and, and I can remember several times in my kids' childhood that they made me and their mama proud. For example, when, when Hunter was about 10 or 11 years old, I don't remember his exact age, but he was about this old, um, we had a resource clinic for the homeless in downtown Birmingham, and uh, Hunter wanted to preach. He said, Daddy, can I preach too? And I said, well, sure. And, and, and Hunter got up and he preached him about a 10-minute message on the grace of God, I think it was. And then I got up after him. And now this is, this is underneath a bridge, under a bridge in Birmingham, Alabama, with about a hundred and something homeless people looking at him. He preached, then I got up and preached, and then I gave the invitation. And during that invitation, a 50-year-old man named Richard got up out of his folding chair that we had provided for him and, and the rest of them, walked down the center aisle, and I thought he was coming to me to get saved. But he bypassed me and went over to Hunter. Hunter's like 11. And he took Hunter by the hand and said, Young man, I need what you have got. And Hunter said, Well, you can get it. And knelt down with that man and led him to Christ in the dirty asphalt underneath the Highway 280 bridge in downtown Birmingham. Uh, My daughter uh, at that same age, uh, sang at my grandmother's funeral. My daughter also, she has a passion for music. Um, She, when we went to the Philippines in in, uh, 2015, she's 18 now, so however old she would have been then, you can do the math. I ain't got, I don't want to get my calculator out, but As a young girl, when we went to the Philippines, we moved there, and she took to it like a duck to water, and uh, about every church service we would go to, uh, they would say, we want Sarah to sing, because she had a voice like an angel, and she would serve God happily. Um, Two Wednesday nights ago, Hunter, who's now uh, 21, uh, preached in our our home church, Wednesday night service for the first time, and me and his mama sat on the front row in awe of our 21-year-old son that, number one, wanted to preach as a 21-year-old. Somebody say amen right there. And number two, did a fantastic job. And this daddy's heart was just beaming with joy. And then uh, on Easter Sunday... And then the, the, the following Sundays during our special Easter 
programs that our choir was a big part of. Our 18-year-old daughter now, Sarah, uh, had uh, lead roles in the music and was out front singing in front of about 2,000 people um, as, a, as a new, newly appointed leader in our choir. And me and her mama just sat there wiping tears away, watching our baby girl serve Jesus. And certainly, I am blessed, uh, all because of the grace of God. Now, our kids have been knuckleheads too. I don't want you to think they're angels. They've been knuckleheads along the way. But, but we've been blessed, and I can certainly say that my children have made me proud, and, and they have been my joy uh, for many years, especially here lately. In, in this chapter, it's really awesome. The church in Thessalonica, or the church at Thessalonica, was started during Paul's, most likely his second missionary journey. That's when he heard the Macedonian call and went to Philippi, which was the chief city of Macedonia. He, Lydia got converted. That's when the young uh, damsel, the young lady, was freed uh, by Paul from an evil spirit. And then, this is Acts 16, I think, uh, Paul and Silas are thrown into prison. They're delivered from prison by a miraculous act of God and the jailer got saved and his whole household. And then uh, they continue on to Thessalonica where they began to preach the gospel each and every week in the temple and also from house to house. And the Bible tells us that some of the people that they preached to believed in the gospel. And those that believed became the nucleus for the church in this city of Thessalonica. Now, some years later, the Apostle Paul is writing to this same group of people and he's instructing them and encouraging them. And that's what we have in the, the book, the, the, uh, uh, the first epistle to the, uh, to the Thessalonians. And he tells them something in verse 19 and 20 that just gripped me when I read it, especially verse 20. He said to them, For ye are our glory and joy. You see, for the Apostle Paul, he took great joy. It was his great reward to see people that he had invested in, uh, who had wanted the Lord, who he had discipled, who he had spiritual investments, when he saw them blossom, he, I can only imagine he gloated in that. Not in a prideful manner, but in a, as a father would, to, would beam at his children like I described with ours. Or, or like a mother would be proud of her daughter uh, becoming a virtuous young woman. I can imagine the Apostle Paul as he looked at his children in the faith and said, i got to tell you something. I need to give you a word of encouragement. You are our glory and joy. He didn't get his glory and joy out of the things of this world. He didn't get his glory and joy out of the offerings that were given to him or, or his name on some marquee somewhere. But what brought him true joy in his life was the spiritual fruit that followed him. And I want you to know this. Every Christian here tonight, can also have rewards. Specifically, rewards in evangelism. We can have those rewards by adding the three characteristics that we're going to see in these verses to our daily lives. So I want to speak to you about the glory and joy 
of evangelism. And don't let the word evangelism scare you. Evangelism, it just simply means to present a message to somebody and give them the opportunity to believe it. You can call it evangelism. You can call it sharing your story. You can call it soul winning. I don't care what you call it. What I care about, and I think what God cares about, is not the terminology, it's whether or not we do it. A lot of people calling a lot of people, or a lot of people calling a lot of things, a lot of different stuff, but they ain't doing it. <laughs> and I think that's what the preacher alluded to in his prayer about not being uh, 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 hearers of the word only, but doers of the word. So, what are the three characteristics we see in this particular context that we need to add to our life? I'm going to give them to you short, sweet, and simple. Amen? That's how I like it. Short, sweet, and simple. Characteristic number one that we're going to see that Paul and his company had right here in these verses, uh, number one is boldness. Boldness. We find that in verses one through six, but I want to hone in especially on verse number two, for the main point of it here, he says, But even after that we had suffered before and were entreated and were shamefully entreated, as you know at Philippi, we were bold. You see that? We were bold. The word boldness simply means freedom from timidity. Not humidity, but timidity. I wish we could have freedom from humidity, don't you? We could use that down in Alabama. But it means uh, free from the spirit of being timid. It means freedom from bashfulness. It, it, it literally means having confidence. The Apostle Paul was probably one of the boldest preachers that there has ever been. Boldness. How are we supposed to manage uh, having this characteristic of boldness in our lives? Well, two ways. Number one, by enduring contention... And number two, by embracing our calling. By enduring contention and embracing our calling. In verse 2 that we just read, uh, the Apostle Paul says something really intriguing before he said that he was bold. He said, but even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as ye know at Philippi, we were bold in our God, to speak unto you the gospel of God, with much contention. Now understand this. What's happening here is Paul is just kind of recounting to those in, in Thessalonica how they came into that city and, and how they approached it. So what he's saying is, hey, remember, when I came here, this is how we conducted ourselves, and this is what we did, this is what we did not do. So he, he's kind of recounting the past or recalling his record in front of them, if you will. Uh, a lot like he did with the Ephesian elders uh, uh, that we uh, talked, uh, that talked about this morning. And so what happens, he said that they went to Philippi and they were shamefully entreated. Shamefully entreated. You know a lot of places that the early uh, church uh, preachers went, they literally got ran out of the town. I challenge you, go study just Acts 13. 
Uh, in Acts 13, they, uh, the, the church there in Antioch of Syria, they, they ordained, in my opinion, they commissioned uh, and ordained and sent away Saul and Barnabas uh, for their, for, to be the first official New Testament church missionaries. They were all fired up, and man, they struck a trail preaching the gospel. And the Bible literally says that the devout women got stirred up, and, and, and the Greeks got stirred up, and everybody else, and they ran them out of the coast. Ran them out of town. You know, that right there would be just about sufficient to send any number of modern-day Christians sucking their thumbs and calling their mama. Or better yet, more accurate, posting all about it on social media. But what happened is, the Apostle Paul was shamefully entreated, and so he decided, well, time to go to Thessalonica. Let's try this again. And when he got there, there was also, as he said, much contention. In other words, it was hard. It wasn't easy. Or as I wrote in my uh, notes here, it was hard then and it's hard now. Now, there's the, the gospel is not hard. Amen? The, 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 Jesus said, hey, just come with the faith of a child. It's not hard to get saved. The Lord has simplified that. It can't get no easier. He paid the price. He paid our debt. It, it, we don't have to buy it with money. We come by faith and we receive Christ. We, we repent. We, we give our heart to God. And so that's not hard, but but I, I have to tell you, sometimes, even as for me as a missionary, one of the toughest things I do is, is try to muster up the courage to be a real vocal witness to my family and friends and even strangers. And, and sometimes you'll hear me preach and say, it's the easiest thing in the world to do. Just to, And sometimes it is. But a lot of times it's hard. But check this out. It was awful hard for the Apostle Paul. But he had boldness as part of his spiritual life. Now, I want to tell you something. Boldness is not just a character trait. Some of you right now, you're thinking, well, I would witness to people, but... I'm just a shy person. That's okay. That just means you need God to give you a good old-fashioned dose of boldness. If you go back Acts 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, all the way through there, there's one thing that the early church apostles and, and the early church Christians constantly prayed for. They prayed for boldness. Why would they pray for boldness? Because they were not bold. In their natural state, they didn't have what it took. Are you following me here? In your natural state, you may not have what it takes. I know for a fact, on my own, I don't have what it takes. But I also know that I have a God who hears my prayers. He answers my prayers. He said, call upon uh, me and I'll answer thee. And listen, we have a God that said, just come and just ask. The problem is, generally, all of our prayer time is taken up with our wants, needs, and desires. Our wants, needs, and desires. And I think God is wanting, needing, and desiring us to call upon Him. God, give me boldness so that I can go and do 
what you've called me to do. I'm here to tes testify, folks, if we ask God to fill us with His Spirit and give us a desire, uh, a want to, and a holy boldness to be witnesses, why in the world would God not answer that prayer? Listen, God doesn't need a bunch of talented speakers who aren't afraid to talk in front of groups. That's not what God needs. You really think God needs your special talent? Think about it for a minute. I mean, let's just think about it. Now, God wants to use our talents, all that stuff. I get that. I'm not saying He don't want... But do you think that that God has set this whole thing up to where, uh, where preaching the gospel to every creature re, re, you know, relies upon some people who happen to be you know, unafraid to talk to others? That don't even make sense. What does it rely on? It relies on God giving His child, children the unction of the Holy Spirit and a holy boldness to enter into those difficult conversations. And I want you to pray, God, give me boldness. The word contention here in verse 2, He said, we came to you with much contention. It means strife in words or debate. It means a quarrel Angry contest or controversy. My goodness. It's, it, it's hard enough when people are sweet. What about if they were having an angry debate? I think you know our society is getting angrier and angrier and angrier. A matter of fact, I think we need boldness just to live. <laughs> Much less... To be witnesses, 2 Timothy 2.3 says, Thou therefore endure hardness as good soldiers of Jesus Christ. Folks, we're soldiers. If you're saved by the grace of God, you and I are supposed to be soldiers on a battlefield. And the prize at stake is is the souls of men. Acts 13.46, the Bible says, Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold. And folks, characteristic number one that we need in our life, that Paul had in his life, is boldness. And we can have that by enduring contention and by embracing our calling. Look at verse 4. The Bible says, But as we were allowed of God, watch this next phrase, to be put in trust with the gospel. Even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who, which trieth the hearts. The apostle Paul knew something. He knew that God had saved him and that God had a purpose for him. Matter of fact, as soon as the Lord knocked him off of that donkey on the Damascus road, he looked up and said, Who art thou, Lord? Jesus said, I'm Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecuteth. And he said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? He knew God had some special calling or purpose for him. And his purpose was that he had been put in trust with the gospel specifically to preach it to the Gentile nations. And can I tell you something? You and I have also been put in trust with the gospel. I mean, he dropped it right in our lap and said, here's the message, now take it to the world. A lot of us, though, have not yet embraced that calling. Listen, it's not a calling to be a preacher. It's not a calling to be a missionary. It's just what comes with the calling to be saved. You are now a carrier of the gospel. And, and the Lord expects you 
to spread it. Amen. This is one good thing in us that we're supposed to spread the gospel. Let me ask you this before I move on. Are you exercising boldness in your Christian witness? Would you pray tonight and just ask God to fill you with boldness? That only comes from heaven. The second characteristic that Paul had that we can adopt is not only boldness, but in verse, uh, let's see, 5 through 7, we find gentleness. Verse 7 says, now he's talking to them, he's recounting how he came to their city. He says, but we were gentle among you. Gentle among you. Gentleness means exactly what you think it means. It means mildness, kindness, humility, or as I like to put it, not, not a jerk, not proud, not arrogant. There's a little too much of that. Listen, boldness boldness does not mean that all of a sudden we get swelled up with pride and it's my way or the highway. You following me? You ever met anybody like that? It's okay to say if you have. How, how, how long did you like to hang around someone like that? About five seconds? And then, then it was just nauseous? The Apostle Paul said, hey, we were bold, but we were also gentle. Gentle. And listen, the world doesn't need to know how right we think we are about everything. The, world, the message the world needs is not how we feel like we have this leg up or that leg up or, or, or whatever it may be. The message they need is the gospel and they need it coming from our lips unafraid, unashamed, boldly proclaimed in a gentle, loving, Christ-like manner. Gentleness. How do we show gentleness? Well, two ways. Number one, by our conduct. And number two, by our care. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4, the Bible says, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. Brother O'Neill, that verse teaches us that all them people that you want to jack up, you just ain't allowed to. Amen? <laughs> Titus chapter 3 and verse 2 says, To speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 1 says, Now I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness of and gentleness of Christ. Gentleness can be added to our life by our conduct. How we conduct ourselves when we're in private, and especially when we're in public, will go a long way, but also by our care. The Bible tells us in verse 7, we were gentle among you, even... Or like a nurse cherisheth her children. And you and I know that that is with tender, loving care. I remember when, uh, good gracious, just so y'all know the time on my iPhone is wrong. 
Amen. <laughs> Some of y'all are like, it ain't wrong. <laughs> when, when we, I told you this morning about that mission we started in Augusta, Georgia. When we were trying to start that mission, we looked at this building that was for sale downtown. $295,000. And I'm like, I ain't got $295,000. But anyway, we called the real estate agent and we went and we uh, got this appointment and he showed us around and all this and that. And uh, long, to make a, 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 a long story short, I just assumed that this real estate agent was trying to weasel us out of every penny we could, he could get us. And, uh, you know, he's representing the seller and he's trying to, you know, all this and that. And so I just assumed that. And so I was like, you know, my motto was, I'm going to be wise as a, a serpent and all this stuff. And, and uh, so all through this process, I was like looking at him with one eye on him, you know, and just expecting him to try to swindle us. And I did not know it, but the whole time, I didn't find out tonight, the whole time he was talking to the owner saying, you ought to give this kid a chance. He's a good kid. He's impressive. Uh, uh, he, he wants to help the homeless. I had no idea about that until after. But we finally made the deal and all this, and the owner actually gave us the building. It was really, really awesome. And we had been uh, had that mission open four, five, six months, and Jim uh, Reeves was his name. That was the real estate agent's name. He called me one day, and I'm like, "Oh, hey, Jim!" And I'm just feeling like, "Hey, we got one up on you, pal. You didn't get to sell it to us. The Lord gave it to us." Of course, I didn't say that, but that's kind of how I felt, you know, because I just knew. It. Still, at that point, he was still trying to. Stick it to the church. Well, he said, I just wondered, he said, there's a homeless man that lives in the woods behind Steinmark on Washington Road, and I was just wondering if maybe you could go check on him, see if y'all could help him. And I thought, <laughs> sure, that's what business we're in. You don't worry about it, Jim, I'll take care of it. And I hung up the phone and a day or two later, I made my way over there and went behind this big department store, Steinmart, and sure enough, there was a trail through the woods, and it led down to the, to, uh, to uh, uh, there was a, what do they call that stuff that grows everywhere? Kudzu. Big old, y'all have kudzu up here? Isn't that stuff anointed of the devil? It, and right in the middle of this big kudzu patch was a homeless camp, and, uh, a tent would, I mean, it looked like it had been there for years. And I went down there, and I got probably from here to the sound booth, and I said, hello, is anyone home? No answer. I said, hello, I'm here from the church. Is anyone home? No answer. I said, hello, I'm here from the mission. Is anyone in there? No answer. Then I said, Jim, the real estate agent, sent me. Is anyone home? And immediately that tent started moving, and a, a head popped out of the zipper, big old long white flowing beard, and this old man said, Jim sent you? I said, yeah. He said, come on down. And I walked down that little trail, he unzipped his tent and out stepped an old, haggard-looking man, weathered, wrinkled face from probably years of alcoholism. And he looked at me and he said, any friend of Jim's a friend of mine. And he shook my hand and told me his name. I can't remember his name. And I'm real confused because the church didn't move him. The mission didn't move him. My name didn't move him. But Jim's name moved him. And I said, say, uh, how do you know Jim? He said, well, sit down and I'll tell you. And he had a couple stumps there and I sat down on one. And he said, 
I've been living out here in these woods a long time. He said, most people laugh at me. Most people ignore me. He said, but the last several years, every Thanksgiving and every Christmas, Jim comes and gets me and puts me in a motel room for the whole week and makes sure I eat real good. He said, he's been the best friend I've ever had. And he just kept going on and on. And as that old man was talking, I was sinking in my pride. And shame. Here I had thought that this real estate agent was trying to get us the whole time. What I didn't realize is before I'd even started helping the homeless in that town, Mr. Reeves cared about folks and was doing whatever he could do to try to ease someone's misery and pain. And boy, the Lord taught me such a big lesson. He took, the Lord just sometimes he takes his axe and he just starts whittling me down to size. And he said, number one, son, you're not the only one that, that cares about people. I've got all kinds of people you don't even know about. Number two, that man was trying to help you get in this building for free the whole time. And number three, you need to learn how to be gentle and just love people like that real estate agent, taught me a huge lesson in my life as a young preacher. Now I want to ask you this question. When you go to share the gospel, are you gentle? Do you really love the person you're, you're talking to? Do you care about them? I want to implore you, care for their souls. Care for their families. Care for their needs. Conduct yourself in a way to where even if they don't like your message, they're going to leave shaking their head saying there's something awful peculiar about that person. Most people don't care for me like that one does. Let me give you a third and final characteristic that we can add to our life if we want to have the glory and joy of evangelism in our life one day. And that third characteristic is willingness. Boldness, gentleness, and in verse 8, the apostle says, so being uh, affectionately desirous of you, we were willing. We were willing. You ever read a verse, uh, preacher? You ever read a verse, and there's a whole lot of words after a certain phrase in that verse, but you just can't quite get past a certain phrase. That we were willing in this verse is what got me. I read that. I must have read that a dozen times when God was kind of giving me this message. And finally, God said, Travis, are you willing? And I had to fess up and say, well, the truth of the matter, the Lord, is about... about a lot of times, I, I'm just not willing. I got stuff to do. I got stuff going on. Or I don't want to mess with them. When you're in the ministry for a long time, <laughs> now these other preachers might leave me hanging here, and it's okay because these are your people, so you can leave me hanging. I'll fess up. Sometimes when you're in the ministry a long time, you see one more person coming, and, and, and sometimes it's like, and I know law enforcement gets like this. It's like, oh man, it, it, just don't even, don't even look at them. <laughs> don't get involved. <laughs> it's a, it's, they'll be a whole lot easier if we just, they go on their way and I go on my way. I remember when I was 20 years old in the ministry, I was hunting people to go help. Oh, man, you know anybody I can go witness to? Hey, how about you, Miss Kathy? You seen any homeless people lately? Nowadays, the phone rings, and I'm like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> Why is that? Backslid, probably, I don't know. But, but it's human nature sometimes to just not be willing 
to do what God's put in front of us to do. So what do we need to do? we got to get real willing. What's that take? It takes this altar. It takes confession. I told the, the gentleman that has a warrant, evidently, for my arrest, I told him earlier that my daddy was in law enforcement, and I, I've loved cops my whole life because that's what I grew up around. The cops were my heroes, and, and that's, that was who I grew up around. And, and I'm still one of them guys that believes uh, the bad cops are like one out of, a, out of a million. Most of them are good, hard-working people that look out for our best interest. But, um, but all my life, I grew up around that. And so when I became a teenager, I had some buddies that were cops, and they let me do ride-alongs with them. And I loved it. And one of my buddies, he taught me what it meant to put on the blinders. He said that about the last hour of his shift, he didn't see nothing. And he explained to me why. He's like, now look, it's time to knock off in 30 minutes. He said, if we go get involved with that dude speeding over there, it could cost us another hour past knocking off time. He said, he said, so sometimes you just have to put on the blinders and go on to the house. And I didn't understand that then. I was like, but you're the cops. You got to go get them. But he was a pretty seasoned cop. And he was like, yeah, they'll, they'll be there for me to mess with tomorrow. But folks, look, the truth is in ministry, in our Christian life, there's just no place for blinders. We can't be like that. We can't operate like that. We have to see what God sees and go where God goes and do what God does. And His ministry is the ministry of reconciliation. And if we want to get to the end of our Christian life and especially to heaven and have some crowns to cast at Jesus' feet, and some rewards, we got to get busy serving God and loving others and telling the story that Jesus saves. We need to be bold, gentle, and willing. So that's the message. I've done my part. I want you to do your part tonight. Let's all stand and if they'll hit the music, let's have an invitation. Let's have an invitation where we gather around the altar and, and this will be twofold. Number one, let's pray over the message we've heard tonight. If the Lord has spoken to your heart at all, at all, come and pray and just say, Lord, here I am, send me, use me, forgive me, whatever it may be. And then number two, let's pray for tomorrow night and for Tuesday night and Wednesday night. Bring somebody with you and let's see what God will do as He uses Brother Steve Hurt uh, to come in and preach. Amen? You go ahead and hit that music and we'll pray. I'll pray and you come and let's just do business with the Lord tonight. Father, we love you. And we thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Thank you for your grace. And thank you, Lord, for this uh, message. Lord, it's, it's not easy for me to live up to a message like this. So, Lord, I pray you'd forgive me. I pray you'd help me, Lord. I pray you'd touch me in my willingness. Lord, I know that's where I need the help the most, is being willing to go and willing to, to, to impart spiritual truth and willing to, to fulfill my assignment from God. Help us, I pray. Lord, there may be other needs that are in this room or being prayed over on these altars, and I pray you'd meet those needs as well. God, I love you and I thank you. Thank you for this church family. I do pray that you bless tomorrow night and then Tuesday and Wednesday as Pastor Steve Hurt comes, I pray you give him safe travel and 
uh, give him exactly what he needs to preach about and fill him with your spirit as he does it. Lord, we'll be careful to thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.